Hey everybody, welcome back. We are on Unit 2, Economic Indicators and the Business Cycle. And we're in Subunit 2.1, the Circular Flow Model and GDP. Now, since this is the first subunit in Unit 2, let's talk a little bit about the title of Unit 2, Economic Indicators and the Business Cycle. Let's start with Economic Indicators. There are three things that macroeconomists care a lot about when looking at an economy. And those three things are GDP, the unemployment rate, and the inflation rate. Okay, we could even say macroeconomists are obsessed with those three things. GDP, unemployment rate, and the inflation rate. Those are the big economic indicators we're going to be looking at in Unit 2. Now, the business cycle. The business cycle, that shows how the economy grows over time. Basically, if you're going to graph the business cycle on the vertical axis, you're going to put the economy, i.e. real GDP. And on the horizontal, you're going to put time, and you're going to show that the economy grows like this which we don't like. We don't like booming, busting, booming, busting, booming, busting. We would much rather grow just like that, okay? But that is the business cycle, that boom-bust cycle, okay, of economic growth. Now, let's get to this subunit, 2.1, the circular flow and GDP. First, guys, the circular flow is not the business cycle. The circular flow, that's what I've got over here. And GDP, well, let's define GDP. What is GDP? It is the total amount of final goods and services produced within a year, within a specific time frame, measured in monetary terms, i.e. measured in dollars. Now, you might not have caught that, so let's do that one more time. It is the total amount of final goods and services produced within a country, within a specific time period, measured in monetary terms, i.e. measured in dollars. Now, you could be a little bit more simple. You could just say, hey, it's a measurement of total output of an economy. And that's perfectly fine in a general broad sense. It's a measurement of the total output of goods and services in an economy. Cool. That's a perfectly fine, simple way to think about it. Now, the circular flow. That's what we've got over here. The circular flow is just a foundational visual for thinking about the macro economy. Now, there's a lot to the circular flow I don't have up here, okay? In fact, there's economic actors I don't have up here, like the government and the rest of the world. There's other markets that are super important in macroeconomics, like the financial market, which I don't have here, and the currency market. But the, these four little components here, they make up what I would say is the core of the circular flow. What we actually mean when we say the circular flow, it gives us the circle. So let's go take a look at that here, okay? So the first thing I'm going to do is using my black dry erase marker, I'm going to show you the tangible things that are flowing, okay? Um, and here's how it goes. From households, we have resources flowing to the resource market. Households are supplying resources to the resource market. Where are they supplying? Land, labor, capital, and entrepreneurial ability. Businesses are demanding those resources, so those resources then flow into businesses. Businesses need those resources because those are the resources that we that businesses use to produce goods and services. You guys, sometimes you might hear of the four factors of production. The four factors of production, land, labor, capital, entrepreneurial ability, they're the same, which gets me to another synonym. Resource market, hey guys, that's factor market. They're one and the same. You can put factor market, resource market, either one works. So, it, you know, good thing here, there's just four types of resources or factors of production that businesses use to make goods and services when we're looking at the economy from a big picture standpoint, which is what we're doing in macroeconomics. All right, so we've got those flowing to businesses. Businesses right here in that box, they use those resources to produce goods and services, and then businesses supply those goods and services, goods and services to the product market. And of course, households demand those goods and services, all right? So that's how the tangible things like resources and goods and services are flowing. But I also want to show you the money flows. Guys, oftentimes when I draw circular flow, I only draw the money flows. Here's what the money flows look like. Households, okay? They are going to earn income. So I'm going to put income right there. They're going to earn income from providing resources. In fact, what they're going to earn is, for land, they're going to earn rents. For labor, they're going to earn wages. For capital, they're going to earn interest. And for entrepreneurial ability, they're going to earn profits. Those two households are types of income. From a household's perspective, rent, wages, interest, and profits are a type of income. They're going to use this income to go buy goods and services, okay? 
So what do we call this? This is household expenditures or just C for consumption. Okay, so that C is consumption, household consumption. Now, this money is then going to flow into businesses as revenue, okay? Total sales, okay? This is the total revenue. It's not profit, it's revenue. It's the total amount of money they get for providing goods and services. Now, with their revenues, okay, they got to pay for those resources. For the land, labor, and capital, guys, those are costs to a business, okay? So I'm going to write cost, but... The entrepreneurial ability, that, though, they get entitled to the profit, so I'm going to say cost plus profit, okay? So, again, what I'm saying here is uh, rents, wages, and interest. Those are types of cost to a business. Profit is just profit, okay? So, again, when businesses think of rents, they think, oh, that's the lease I have to pay on my office space. That's a cost. When they think of wages, oh, that's a cost to us. When we have to pay our workers, that's a cost. Interest. Oh, that interest I have to pay because I borrowed money to buy that real capital. That's a cost. So rent, wages, and interest are costs to a business. They are forms of income to household. Anyhow, that is our foundation of the circular flow. Now, let's combine the two. When we calculate GDP, there are three ways to calculate GDP. The first way is known as the expenditure approach, okay? The expenditure approach, it is the most important, so I am going to put an asterisk. The expenditure approach. When we do the expenditure approach, we say the following. We say GDP equals C plus I plus GP plus XN. Now, this is going to be a little bit interesting, okay? Because I don't have everything on this circular flow right now. But what I'm saying is GDP equals total spending on goods and services. The way this is drawn, the only spending we have is household. But here's the thing, guys. I put government up here, and I can have government spending money. I can have businesses also not just providing goods and services, but they can also be spending money on real capital. I can have the rest of the world coming in here and spending. If we, the big key is this is where spending happens. This is where expenditures happen. So the idea is if we can go figure out everything that was bought, all the goods and services that were bought, we will know all the goods and services that were produced. That's what the expenditure approach is all about. If we add up all the spending on goods and services, we'll know the total amount of goods and services produced. So the expenditure approach, we associate right here where spending happens. So I'm going to put expenditure approach. Now, all that money is then going to flow to the resource market, right? Guys, one of those resources is going to get, I mean, all that money is going to go to one of those, re, or one, or, well, it's going to go to each of those resources, right? Meaning every single dollar that we get in revenue can be accounted for in the rent, wages, interest, or the profits, right? It's got to be. So if we can just add up rent, wages, interest, and profits, if we could add up those four things, we would know the amount of money that was spent. Because remember, revenues is what businesses collect on all the spending on their goods and services. It's total sales data. And that revenue is going to flow into one of these types of income. So I'm going to write income approach right here. And the idea is these two are basically supposed to be the same thing, all right? So that is another way to calculate GDP. Let me get it down here. Income approach. We could do the income approach. We could simply say, hey, GDP equals wages plus rent plus interest plus profits. If we add up those, that should equal all the spending in the economy. Those two should equal. Again, income approach, expenditure approach. Finally, there is one other way to calculate GDP, and it is known as the value added approach. The value added approach. Now, that value added approach, I really can't show in circular flow, so let me just talk to you for, about it for a second. Guys, GDP, total amount of final goods and services produced within a country, within a specific time period, measured in monetary terms, but let's focus on that word final goods and services. So GDP is only looking at the spending on final goods and services. Okay, what I mean by final goods and services is goods and services ready for their end use. Okay, like the farmer buying the tractor, like the bait, uh, sorry, like um, us going to the grocery store and buying the loaf of bread. Okay, those things are final goods and services. 
There are also intermediate goods, okay? There's the flour that the, the bread maker buys, okay? That's not a final good or service. When the bread maker buys flour, that's an intermediate good or service, okay? So GDP is the total amount of final goods and services produced. Why don't we count all those intermediate goods? Here's the key. Well, we kind of do. The reason we don't count them again is because it would be double counting. You see, in the price of the final good or service, in the price of the final good and service, has all the value that was added into the good, okay? We know the price of the flour because the price of the flour was less than the price of the bread. It is in the price of the bread, okay? So we don't want to count the price of the flour and the bread, else we'll be double counting. So the value-added approach basically says, hey, I'm going to look at every step in the production process as I work our way to the final good or service. And if I add up the value added at every single step, okay, not the total value, okay, but just the value added at every single step, I will know the price of that, fi the price of that final good or service, okay? And so the value-added approach should also give us the same exact number. So again, three approaches, guys. Expenditure approach, income approach, value-add approach, all three approaches should give us the same number for GDP. Hopefully that made sense to you. We'll see you in the next video.